Hello everyone, welcome back. Today we are joined by Tom Wainwright, who is physiotherapist and associate professor of orthopaedics at Bournemouth University. So welcome Tom, thank you for joining. Good to see you, thank you for inviting me. No problem. So Tom and I have known each other for four or five years now when he, he purchased some equipment from us for a research project. So we'll we'll talk about his work later on. Um, but Tom, tell me that how you got started. Like when you were growing up, like what was your view on becoming a physio? Was that something you wanted to do at an early age? Uh, no, no, it was probably um, sort of teenage years. Um, I was a, uh, well, not... Uh, well, a uh, aspiring footballer. I had signed schoolboy forms back in the day when it that was the system, and played for Exeter City from when I was uh, four, you know, fourteen at schoolboy forms all the way up to eighteen, nineteen. Um, but I probably, in my heart of hearts, knew that I wasn't going to be good enough to make a full time career out of it. So, um, uh, at the time of seventeen, eighteen, I also um, did my my A levels as well, um, as well as playing. And um, at that stage, I had a couple of injuries, and uh, we had a at, at the time at Exeter was a there was a great uh, physio, and he had treated me for a couple of injuries, and I got interested in it. And I thought, well, at that stage, if I if I can't be a professional footballer, my ambition at that stage was to be, you know, a, a physio in professional football or professional sport. So that's how my interest grew, and I sort of through that network and through other networks, I did some work experience at, at the club there, but also at Oxford United, I did some um, sort of work experience. And, and then after I got released from football at 18, 19, um, I hadn't applied for university at that stage. So I went off traveling for a year and uh, applied for university while I was off traveling. Um, and then came back and did physiotherapy um, after being away for a year. All right, very good. So are you from Exeter area originally then? Yeah, so I grew up in Devon, yeah, a town called Otry St Mary, just outside Exeter. Uh, um, yeah, and I, yeah, that's where I grew up. And then, um, as I said, until I travelled after school, you know, after school and after football, and then uh, went and did my undergraduate at Coventry Uni. Okay, so you found yourself travelling and then, you know, sort of got... Got to know the real, the real top. Uh, I did. <laughs> uh, I found my way around a few bars, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> worked as a removal man in Australia, so you know, really, um, really highbrow stuff. No, but it was, I'm, you know, I'm quite pleased. It's not. It wasn't on social media in those days, and there's no record of <laughs> of that year apart from the embellished stories that I now tell every now and again. <laughs> yeah, no, that I just did removals in Australia for a bit as well. That yeah. Was, um, yeah. Yeah, again, definitely not highbrow, but yeah, that was uh, one of the best ones. It was quite cool because it was, um, I say it was cool, it wasn't cool at all, but um, we basically had the contract for fitting out the Olympic Village. So I moved all 22,000 wardrobes, cabinets, beds <laughs> that went in the Olympic Village, I moved them all in. So everyone, <laughs> I handled every one of them. Like, there was six of us who did 22,000 of those. So. Yeah, it was it was good fun. It was with some you know some guys that are my best you know some of my best friends now, and um, we had a great you know we lived in a great flat on the beach. Um, would work hard and then come back for a surf each each night and a few beers. And it was yeah it was brilliant. It was um it was a great time in my life, and you know you only realise now the freedom that you that you had really and no responsibility as well, which was nice. Yeah, well you're in Bournemouth, so at least you've got a decent beach yeah. nearby you anyway. Yeah. So yeah, so why Coventry then? Um, truth be told, it was the last one that I put on my UCAS form, um, but <laughs> as these things happen, um, and it was also the last place that, the last university, the only university that gave me a place, um, so um, I got five rejections up until that point, um, and, uh, but I, I did know, uh, I sort of joke about it, but I put it down because um, at that stage, Coventry had a very good reputation for physio and courses and scored well. Um, but yeah, I sort of, uh, yeah, rocked up on the, the first day having, um, never, never been there, only looked at it on the prospectus and from, from that, but, you know, very fortunately I had a fantastic time. It was a great, great course. Um, 
made you know within a week or so some really you know great friends who you know still friend you know best friends now and um yeah we worked hard and we 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 did well but i think we we played hard as well which was which was great and we had some great lecturers um and sort of um role models so it was it was great it was a great experience mm. and then at what point in that did you decide like, well what was your first job when you came out of there was that geared around the placements that you'd had um so i yeah i had a very placement i think my my first job my first nhs job was down here in bournemouth so at that time when you when you're at university um it was it was a very fortunate time because if you if you'd done your degree and qualified then there was always going to be a job for you i mean that that has been different at points over the last 20 years um and i kind of was looking at jobs i thought I either want to go to london to a big teaching hospital or I want to go to somewhere by the by the coast, and I mean it was as simple as um, Bournemouth was the first job that I you know got an interview for um, when they sort of were going around in the May time when we were coming up to um, you know graduate. I'd had a few good weekends down here, seeing friends and at a wedding and things. Um, I thought it looked a nice place, and I got offered offered one of the rotational jobs. Um, you know, at that point it was quite. It was quite rhythmical each summer that you know each trust would take on so many juniors and there was about five of us that they recruited um but they then asked two of us to not start until the december so after i graduated i then went across and i didn't have any money but i found this sort of um uh, volunteer opportunity and i went and worked in um india for about um well, about three four months in the July, August to December time. So working in a um, uh, sort of a, well, it was like a polyclinic hospital there, um, treating patients with polio and cerebral palsy and those kind of things, making AFOs and calipers and things like that. So <clears throat> that was like my first job, which was very, um, looking back on it now, it was it was very much in at the deep end, but you, you know, it was, it was fantastic learning experience. Um, and I'd, I'd wanted to do something physio related because I, I was worried that when I graduated, I'd forget everything by the time I started in, De in December. So, but I didn't have any money. So I had to, you know, it was literally, I paid my airfare to get there and then uh, I lived there for, you know, for free as if, if I worked. So that was, um, that was it. And then I, then I started down here in, in the December. Uh, and, what was you know, India like actually, before you go on to that, what was India like living there? Um, it was, yeah, it was, um, it was a fantastic experience. So it was in a place called um, uh, Budgaya, which is um, in Bihar. Um, and for those that are interested in Buddhism, that's where the Bodhi tree was. And, and I'm not um, sort of religious in any way, but I lived on a, it was a, basically a monastery. And they did lots of courses and teachings for, um, you know, visitors and people from the West going over to learn about Buddhism. But all the money that they, they made, they really they had a school that they um, that they supported, and they also had this um, clinic which supported those that couldn't afford, um, you know, going into the city or the nearest city for healthcare. And at that time, you know, 1999, well, no, 2003 sort of time, they were still getting a real problem with getting the um, polio vaccine to everyone. Um, there was access to it, but um, what would that would mean is actually quite often it wouldn't be refrigerated. So there was a lot of children um, with contractures in their legs, arms, um, with you know, it was due to polio, something that was you know obviously in the UK in the 50s. Um, but over there, like Bihar is probably one of the most um, socially, you know, economically deprived states, and still is in India. Um, and if you, you know, if you can't walk, you're not really offering anything to the family. So the, we, you know, it's quite unbelievable when you think about it. We were, for those contractures where we could correct them, we were kind of serial casting them um, to stretch out a contractor to a point. And then we were making calipers with crutches so that they could walk, um, or in some cases, um, helping them provide with the pedal carts and things like that so they could get about, um, I mean, and also sort of, I suppose there was also other bits that came up and, um, you know, other conditions. There was a lot of um, children with sort of hemiplegia, which I, I think was mainly related to um, 
problems at birth and a lack of oxygen, you know, a lack, lack of oxygen at birth. So very sort of actually problems that were quite difficult, but a lot of it was educational. Um, a lot of it was um, for those, some of those problems um, through an interpreter there, you know, getting families to understand what the limitations for those people would be. And that was a tension because you were often quite looked at that you were going to come and solve their problems and provide some kind of miracle um, cure, which obviously, you know, you, you couldn't, you know, um, and that, you know, it was, it was um, uh, a really great learning and life experience, I'd say. And um, also you met a load of very interesting people, the Rinpoche's in the, um, who were doing the teaching and things within the, um, uh, within the sort of institute, you know, linked to the monastery. They were fascinating people. So, so worldly wise and you know you'd, you'd end up having you know chatting to them over dinner and there's a lot of um monks that would come down from tibet and things so yeah it was in nepal it was yeah it was fantastic it was a great learning experience yeah mm, no, i can imagine so yeah so how did you find it when you turned up back in bournemouth then what was your what were you doing there so i just started on um rotate you know rotations i went in worked at um, Christchurch Hospital, one of our hospitals here, and outpatients, and it was very much the familiar, um, you know, four-month rotations at that stage. And I, I sort of um, did outpatients, and then um, uh, ITU um, and respiratory, and then orthopedics, which is kind of when I'd I'd enjoyed orthopedics as a student, um, and it was kind of at the end of my orthopedic rotation where through a bit of luck and a bit of um, happenstance um, I talked my way into a secondment for a year working with one of the orthopedic consultants down here um, to do some uh, a research job and I was I was due to go on to um, care of the elderly uh, rotation um, and so the opportunity to run a, uh, a randomized controlled trial that was looking at different types of hip replacement um, came up for a year because uh, the, the the research physio that was working on the project was off on maternity leave. So um, she'd already gone and they were, I think they were desperate to fill the space. And so I managed to talk myself into to the job. And and then that really was the start of my tangent in, into orthopedic research and orthopedics um, from where I've worked for the last sort of 20, well, near, nearly 20 years, 18 years or so. Right. Yeah. So uh, did you ever have a vision of, of moving into anything other than in that orthopedic actual treatment side? Um, no, I suppose if I if you'd asked me when I started, I think the plan was to do my junior rotations for a couple of years. And then through my travels, I've been to Australia and New Zealand. The plan was always to sort of go back there, travel again and do a master's over in Australia or New Zealand and and um, do that in manual therapy or, 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 or sports physics. Yeah, or something related to that and you know um you know live over live and work there for a period but um i'd, I'd enjoyed research so i'd i'd very i'd i'd really got into my thesis um as an undergraduate and i presented that at the physio research society you know as an abstract and things which you don't do for you know that's not all you know students don't always get that much into their research so i'd enjoyed that and i'd it was an area that I'd always enjoyed, but I, it was definitely not a plan to become a, uh, you know, a, an academic or a researcher. Mm. And did like when you were at university, then when you're doing your thesis, did you ever, when you were speaking with tutors and so on, did they ever give you guidance or say, we actually, you think you could be good in research or any other particular area? I don't think so. No, I think at that stage, I don't, <clears throat> and if they had, if they did, I'd maybe, I don't think I'd have, I think I was quite, I think I knew what I was, I was pretty sure that I wanted to be an MSK outpatient physio and I wanted to work in sport and I didn't know what sport, but that was what I wanted to do. And, and I think maybe that that's probably similar for a lot of people entering physio as a profession. And then as, as you go through the degree, you, you understand about the different opportunities and, you know, I, I really enjoyed working in ITU and respiratory. That was actually really, you know, I enjoyed that. Um, and so you, I'd have never have thought about that before I started the course. I knew that physios worked in that area, but I didn't understand the role as, as you would now. So, you know, I think it's a fantastic profession from that perspective because there's so, there are so many different areas that you can, you can work in and specialize in. But um, no, I, I had, um, you know, the lecturer who helped me with my thesis was a lady called Jane Daly and she was really encouraging um, and, and, you know, really 
you know great to work with but it was just a project that I had to do that I really got into you know that that was as simple as that really mm. and then so you move, make that move or a slight tangent as you say into research and was it something that you immediately thought oh yeah actually I can can see myself moving into this more permanently yeah definitely um it was definitely in at the deep end and um if I look at how we train our researchers now you know I was literally on my own and had to figure it out um because the the person in there was um who was previously in there she had just had a baby she was off having a baby and even at the time at that point the hospital the R&D department was an R&D manager and another person you know now there's you know I don't know how many people in the R&D department but it must be over 50 you know it's a big department but it wasn't that wasn't the case so it very much was learning on the hoof but after about sort of six months or so I, I really enjoyed it and we we also then started a new project using um, computer navigation um, to guide um, um, hip resurfacing surgery at that point. And so I got in at that at the start and that was, I was operating the navigation equipment in theatre whilst um, Prof Middleton or Rob, Rob Middleton, the surgeon was doing the operation. So I, I was sort of writing an exciting project. It was, you know, it was stuff that was pretty cutting edge in orthopedics and I was, you know, learning loads of new skills, operating equipment in theatre, helping a surgeon put it in. So it was, it was exciting, you know, when you look back at it, it was exciting. And I kind of realised that I, I wasn't going to go back and that this was something I wanted to look at. And so then the challenge came, okay, well, how, how can I get some more grant funding in that would allow me to continue to work doing this? And um, when Shelley came back from her her maternity leave because there would, there would obviously be two of us so um i managed to do that and then for a period of a few years i worked part part-time research so three days a week running sort of research and then i did two days a week in the outpatient department um and i was also doing my my um i'd started my master's at that time as well so i was um you know i was i was sort of um which i'd started off on doing the manual therapy masters but then as the couple of years went through and it became clear that probably I was going to stay in research I changed the sort of placement modules of that for more research-based modules that would be more relevant to the sort of path I was I was going down. Right so who's actually paying you at this point then? So I was employed at the hospital so um, and you know um, but the at the hospital at that stage you know for research there's no budget within a you know, within a department normally for it. So you need grant income. So the grant would come to the hospital and then that would pay for my salary through, you know, through the, through the hospital. Right. Okay. And then also when you say getting trained up in research, so for those people who don't work in that area, what does that actually constitute? Uh, what in my experience or how we would train people? Um, yeah, yeah. Whatever you, yes. Yeah, so what, briefly say what yours was and then what it is now, I guess. Um, I mean, that now there is like really good, um, you know, guidance and great support from, um, so I'm, I'm fortunate I have a contract um, here at the university, but also a contract at the hospital. So I'm employed by both organisations. So we have a great R&D department at the hospital and, you know, your sort of gateway into research training is what you call a GCP training, which is good clinical practice, which is a uh, a, a sort of basic training in being involved in clinical research but then <clears throat> you know there's you know depending on your role within it there's obviously everything from research methodology and trial design to statistics um, also there's everything to you know data management strategies governance and safety um, depending on what research you're doing so um, there's you know the thing I find exciting about research is you know, you, you, you're continually not just learning about your clinical subject, but you're also learning about the research methodology, which is the appropriate one to use to answer the clinical question you're trying to answer. So you've kind of got these, these two disciplines, really, your clinical discipline, but then, you know, the research side is also a discipline to become, to become good at as well. Mm. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, you've got a really impressive list of successful grant applications that you've, that you've, um, you've managed to achieve like when you're putting together one of these grants like I guess it's it's a fine balancing act between going for the research area that you want to go into and also trying to find something that fits what is likely to get funded 
how do you how do you look at in terms of which ones you want to go for and, and what sort of route you're going to take your research it's a really good question so um i suppose to if we take the orthopedic research institute here at bournemouth uni so myself and prof middleton we um set that up just over five years ago now yeah over five five six years ago and <clears throat> at that stage we had research going in the hospital which we wanted to you know transfer over and um and sort of have under the university umbrella as well um but we also were getting opportunities that we were turning down because it was just myself and rob and so if there's only the two of you that there's a limited capacity of what you can do um and most of a lot of that research was um you know through our um partners in industry um and um, I previously, prior to here, I, I left off, I stepped out of working full time in the NHS uh, for about five or six years and had um, my own consultancy business doing sort of management consultancy with, within healthcare, both with both on research projects with companies, but also on service redesign and a more management consultancy basis. So I suppose that's relevant because you know, if you're pitching for a consultancy project or you're pitching for research money, you've got to make a case, haven't you? So you've got to understand um, where the overlap happens between what the funder's looking for um, and what the clinical question or the interest that you've got. And it's it's about, I would say, it's about identifying that, that sweet spot. Now, the other issue where that becomes more difficult is when we started up the Institute, we had quite... Um, um quite substantial funding targets to meet so you had to spread the net wide because you needed to bring funding in to to to, re to support the return on the investment the university had made so i suppose at that point you're probably looking at things where your skills um are wanted by someone and it's a more of a contract contract research i.e you're you've got the patience and the skills to do it but it may not be the um, clinical question that lights your fire and passion you, you know, completely, but it's relevant, it's interesting, um, and it's worthwhile to the funder. And it also enables you to bring money into support, you know, bringing re research assistance, bringing in support staff. So over the years, we've grown the nucleus of staff around us at the Institute, but we've done that by bringing in pro projects that fund those posts. So there's a, there's always a blend, I suppose, if we look now, we've, we're narrowing in focus and we have done in terms of the things that really interest us and we are passionate about in terms of um, where we want to um, become, you know, you know, lead the way and, 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 and thinking in, in certain areas of treatment. And so for me, those areas are sort of um, conservative management of osteoarthritis or the non-surgical management. So I've got an NIHR funded trial um, looking at um, a cycling and education intervention versus normal physiotherapy um, to see, you know, which, which can um, both clinical and health out economic outcomes, which can better treat patients with hip osteoarthritis. And then I've got a number of uh, a number of projects looking at outcomes after hip and knee replacement. My, my specific interest at the moment is um, characterizing recovery trajectories post-op. Um, so, and why that's important is um, undoubtedly there's there's groups of patients where we can improve rehabilitation and improve um, and expedite re return to you know normal activities. Um, but actually, if you look at the literature, we've got a very poor understanding of how we characterize which patients need which input and how we can we can use that clinically. Um, and so that's where the studies using the Primus and the Gate Lab that we've got here. Um, uh, are really exciting because we're at the moment in a couple of studies creating some of the most comprehensive data sets of recovery in the first year after surgery than, 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 I, than I can find in the literature. So we're, we're really excited about those and what, what insights that will give us about how we can improve rehab in the future. Mm. So is the idea for, for, what you, for what you're working on, would you like to see this replicated in a number of different NHS facilities around the UK? Um, I suppose, you know, 
the where I, I think research is exciting is is I, I suppose as a physio, I love being a physio full time because you had the opportunity to help someone recover or educate them or advise them or you know um, partner with them in their recovery. Do you know what I mean? And that that to be able to help someone on that way and guide them, um, you know, is a real you know is a real kick is a real kick to that. You know, that's that's exciting. I suppose research is exciting because you know there's a you're slightly more removed from that, but the opportunity is for you to provide insights and understanding so that <clears throat> your research can then help other um, can help guide other professionals and therefore by the default other patients in how they you know recover um, from from conditions and you know hip and knee replacement are you know very high volume very um, you know some would say routine operations but you know if we look at the latest you know there's meta-analysis and research that shows that actually, you know, at six months post-operatively, patients are less active than they were pre-operatively. But pre-operatively, they would say that they're less active because their hip or their knee hurts. But actually, the meta-analysis tell us at six months, they, they don't get that activity level. And that's going to be a real um, issue because there's research that comes, that has been done in Denmark, where they can integrate their primary care, you know, community data with their hospital data and also their um, government records and it shows that even though hip and knee replacements are successful at reducing pain they continue to provide a cost burden to society because patients never return to the amount of work that they were doing pre preoperatively you know post-op they you know they don't contribute as much to taxes they don't they need more resources from social and health care and that's really important i think because I don't know you and I what the pension age for us is you know we're going to be working till we're at least 70 or well, you might retire on your yacht before that Andy but I'll, I'll be here till I'm 70 but at that you know there's going to be a lot of people that have a lot of living to do after their hip or knee replacement both in terms of their social and their fun activities but also we need to get them back to work so I think there, there are things that we we can do and you know, in rehab, if we're being honest, not much has changed since I was a student and did my first placement at the Nuffield Orthopaedic Centre. Protocols haven't really evolved and as much as I think they could. And so I think it's an area that has, you know, um, you know, a lot of value and a lot of interest, both from a clinical and research perspective. Mm, yeah, no, it is really interesting. But how a question that we always have is like when we're presenting equipment to people is like what's what's the evidence on this? What's the research? And sometimes it can be frustrating because whatever evidence you present to them is like right. Well, that's not our demographic. We don't see those people. We we work with athletes. We don't work with athletes. That's American data. This is UK data. So how do you see yours being applied? Like, do you have? Do you have a real clear idea of what impact you want your research to have in terms of whether it's for industry, but also then the clinical end users? Yeah, I think, I mean, you, you, the hope is that, yeah, uh, you know, that there's no, if your research has no impact, there's, you know, not really much point in, in doing it. So yeah, that, that is the hope. And I suppose Part of that is in making sure that you um, design the research well and conduct the research really well, um, and that you're researching things that are important to other people. I mean, if you're researching something that's not important to other people or other people don't share or don't think it's important, then it probably will have a limited shelf life. So, um, I mean, that that is, so if we take the work that I'm doing around, let's try and, let's try and apply an applied example. So um, we're trying to characterize the trajectory of recovery about when um, patients recover and at what speed and at what time points post-surgery they make certain improvements in certain aspects of their recovery. Why might that be important? Well, at the moment, you, there's a plethora of different um, activity monitors, you know, like whether it's an Apple Watch, a Garmin Watch, a Fitbit or whatever. There's also loads of different apps you can get on your phone that are for hip and knee replacement and it guides you what to do. But actually none of them are adaptive to a patient's recovery. What most of them have done is they're actually just replicating what we've got on paper booklets and saying, okay, at one week, at two weeks, you need to do this. At three weeks, you, at six weeks, you can do this. 
but the opportunity in the future, let's say with that technology and the research that we're doing is to say, okay, well, we know for your pay, you, that you as an individual, you're, you, we characterize similar patients to, to what, what you, to, to your out, your sort of profile pre-op in both your physical capabilities, comorbidities, you know, um, socio sort of economic, you know, groupings, as well as your, um, you know, your outlook on life through, you know, sort of anxiety, depression scales. And for patients like you, we would expect you to be at this point at six weeks. Do you see what I mean? And so the future is then to say, okay, on the app, it's to alert both the patient or the provider in some way that they can say, oh, actually, they're on, they're, you know, they're, they're on trajectory, they're doing well as expected, or they're not doing so well, or they're overdoing it but then also provide things that then help that patient to self-manage it. So the ideal is that they can say, well, okay, I've done this many steps for, the, for you know, five days in a row. So if you've only done 5,000 steps and you're always doing that each day, that patient won't make improvements, will they? They'll just get good at doing 5,000 steps. If that patient wants to work, walk further or want to be able to do more, then it's saying, okay, well, actually, you know, some of the research that we're doing here is, how many steps should a patient be walking at what point post-surgery? Um, well, it obviously, it'll obviously depend on the patient, but at the moment, we, we, can't, we can't characterize that. We can give general advice, but why not be able to find answers so that people can, can guide their recovery? So, I mean, that's a bit of a tangent, but I'm just trying to bring in where, you know, we've got these such opportunities with technologies and different things, and the hardware's there, but the software still has to be informed by research that's collected in a controlled environment with other variables controlled for so that we can we we can make conclu conclusions about it yeah no i think that's a really good idea and that's it like you say i've got a, an apple watch you use it regularly some to some extent it's gimmicky um, but i think if you've got a specific thing that you're coming back from surgery or something like that if you can use the data that you were using before and then implement that into it, some sort of rehabilitation it's more specific for me than it is for you or for waldo for example then you know it's it sort of makes it more relevant doesn't it more engaging so um yeah and no, i think that's 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 really interesting so for something like that i know you just use that as an example but do you see that being adopted by the nhs or by commercial angle so you know you've got an apple i mean is it one of the biggest orthopedic companies zimmer biomet in the states they've partnered with apple so they're partnering to, to provide this kind of um, connected sort of solution or approach, which is, which is great. Um, yeah, the difficulty is how we implement that within the NHS and how, how we, um, you know, for that, for that example, you've obviously got to have an Apple Watch and you've got to have an, you know, an iPhone. So that excludes a lot of people <laughs> or you've got to provide that as part of their, their you know, their, their treatment. So I think that's where you've got to be practical. So that's where you've got to say, okay, well, can you actually achieve the same thing with a Fitbit? Or could you actually achieve the same thing with a paper diary about where you walked or things? So I think you've got to be adaptable. Um, but I think if we look, you know, going forward, so arthritis as, as our demographics and as our population ages, the societal burden due to osteoarthritis whether that be days off work whether that be um you know limitation to activities is going to become bigger and bigger and you know arthritis is a massive you know disease burden it's one of the main reasons you know across the many joints that patients go to their gp um now it's not life-threatening but it, it is completely quality of life limiting and I think as we need to be more active longer in our life, it's going to be um, more and more of an you know more of a um, an issue that we need to address with both research and you know um, innovations in practice which allow the patient to self-manage because we're just not going to have the capacity you know we don't want to have to do an operation on everyone we want to find ways of avoiding the operation if we can do and getting patients to self-manage and educate them how to self-manage both their you know arthritis in the first stage but also recovery in those things and you know yes there'll be people that need physio and you know you know more one-to-one -one treatment or group sessions those things and that's great but we've got to be pragmatic haven't we we've got to think about how we can um you know apply that in a health system which 
you know, is free at the point of service, but has a limited amount of capacity and a limited amount of, you know, funding. Yeah. So is, is there any, is, is, is there pockets of money on well, focus? Is there a focus on specific uh, conditions at the moment then that is actually being, uh, the grants being made available for? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we're, we're not we're, we're not currently applying for any but yeah you know there's um for those involved in research these will all be very familiar things but you know um organizations like the national institute for health research um and you know the other big you know research councils and big you know both um third sector and charity funders but also mrc leverhulme trust and all these kind of big funders you know there's there's frequent calls for, for research and you know, we're here in Bournemouth, we're, you know, very much a, a small orthopaedic research institute. There's, you know, there's very big orthopaedic research groups, you know, um, Oxford, Southampton, Leeds, you know, Imperial to name, you know, name, you know, some of the more well-established and big, you know, big universities. So yeah, there's lots of research in orthopaedics and there's lots, lots of um, funding available. And it is one of those areas where there's also a lot of industry funding available because obviously, industry has a large part in it both with the implant but also increasingly with the technologies supportive technologies to to put the implants in whether that be you know ro robots to help put the surgery in or you know um, as we've been talking about wearables and those kind of things to facilitate recovery so um you know there, there's 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 you know a broad range of different places people can get funding for and, and then there's you know, smaller pots of funding for people to get started in research. So things like the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy offer small grants for, for you know, novice researchers. Um, and also there's training fellowships that you can get through the National Institute for Healthcare Research. And, and then there's also organisations like Versus Arthritis, um, the Orthopaedic Research, you know, UK that, you know, are specific funders. So, yeah, there's lo lots of, lots of, opportunity but you know as with everything it's it's competitive yeah yeah and how does this does any funding translate into the nhs for actual clinical application like for working in whether it's outpatient departments or whatever it is um most national institute of health research is one example which is sort of the you know the central funding body through the nhs for, for research so um in the trials that um the trial that I've got there, they will they will support um, costs that go over and above standard care um, as part of the research. So they won't they won't pay for standard treatment or care, but they will pay for the um, visits that are required that are over and above you know what standard care would be. So, um, for instance, some of our trials where we look at new hip implants, we follow patients up for ten years to look at the survivorship of the implant. Now, obviously, if you've had a hip replacement and, you know, locally, our local funding agreement is if you're if you're doing well after the implant, we'll maybe see you once or twice in orthopedic outpatients, but then we'll discharge you. And then the GP will cover any follow up from that, you know, in a, in a clinic environment. So if we're wanting to see them annually with an X-ray to check on the new prosthesis, then we'll do that within the hospital, but we'll receive additional funding. Um, you know, from from the funder to support those costs, so that that research is not costing the NHS and you know any, any anything additional. Right. Okay. So, in terms of being in research, then what qualities do you think you need to have in that that you maybe don't need in in other areas? Um. um well, you've got. To, I think you've got to have a. You've got to have an. You've got to have a real passion for it. Do you, do you know what I mean? I think. Um, and I think it's like most things you've got to, you've got to work, you know, it goes out saying you've got to work hard. I think, um, I think we've all got, we've all, you know, it's like, um, you know, if you're down in the pub with your mates, you've all got your pipe dreams of a business, haven't you? Or, a, you know, or a venture or something like that. But, you know, when you see something on the television, it's how oh, that's a great idea. But the reality is behind what's presented, there's a lot of hard work, isn't there? And it's the same, same with research. Um, you know it's we've all got an idea for research but actually pulling it off finding a way to fund it and then to to carry out the research is you know takes a lot of takes a lot of work and i don't i don't think that is i think anyone can apply themselves and do that i'm um, for sure um i think you've got to 
um, be collaborative. You can't do it on your own. You've got to, um, you know, work across systems, often across departments. You, you know, and definitely the work I can I could not do any of my work without a great team and great colleagues around me, but also, you know, a wider team within the hospital that you work with on a you know day to day basis. Um, I think also the research there is a point where you do have to because you know, whether it's ethics applications or annual reports or data collection, you know, all our studies are monitored externally to ensure that we've done everything correctly. So you probably do have to have a streak in you where you like all the T's crossed and the I's dotted. So, I mean, if that's, if that bit doesn't, if you've not got that bit in you, it's probably not for you because you do need to make sure it's all bang on. And that's definitely not for some people. Um, but um, apart from that, I'd say, yeah, no, I think it's, like anything, you know, hard work and application. And I probably, the other bit to say is a passion for it. I, I probably don't, you won't think, I won't think about it too much, but I'm very passionate about what I do. And, um, you know, I'm fortunate to enjoy it. So I think that's, that's also important because I don't think you can keep going unless you, you, you enjoy what you do. Mm. Did you get funding for that Dyson, Dyson uh, fan you got in the background there? That's, that's impressive. No, I just, I just, uh, you know, just did, you know, when I'm to cool down, you know, um, but no, um, I, I think, you know, in terms of the equipment that we've got here at the university, not, not talking about the fam, you know, Primus and things, we, we've been really fortunate in terms of the grants that we've, we've got and we felt a responsibility to make sure that we, we um, return on that investment. So, you know, by having that funding to get the, the equipment in, we've then been able to attract funding to do research that we wouldn't have been able to do previously. So we've got a really good gate lab and we've got a great team that, that work, work to run the gate lab. And, and that's allowed us to get funding from companies that we wouldn't have got without the gate lab. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we, we realize we're very fortunate with the equipment and facilities we have. Um, but also that spurs us on to work hard to make sure that we, um, you know, we, we, we get a return on that. Yeah. And do that when you've produced the research, is there any comeback on things? So will that get reviewed and will the, the funder ever come back and assess you on that and say, we're happy with it. We're not happy with it even. Yeah. So, I mean, um, absolutely. So, you know, all our research we submit to journals and is, you know, external, you know, peer reviewed, um, you know, so, you know, that's one of the things about the academic community, really, you know, um, you know, you, you're in publishing in, in good journals with, you know, good peer reviewers is, you know, you know, you, you always get helpful comments back, you know, on a, you know, whether it's accepted or rejected, um, that help you improve and, and learn. Um, so that's in terms of publications. Yeah, I think you have to be very clear when you work with companies. Um, about um, who has sort of editorial um, control. So we're very clear that, um, you know, if we're going to work with a company, we write the protocol um, very carefully and we're very upfront to say that whether this is a positive or negative result to this study, we will publish it. So I think that's important because publishing um, you know, not negative results, but pu publishing results where it hasn't improved as much, or you may think it's going to improve, but it's no different. That is as important as publishing something if it goes really well. Now, obviously, um, for a fire alarm's just going off, I may have to go. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Um, I'll just wait and see if anything happens. <laughs> Give me two seconds. I don't think it was scheduled. Yeah. Andy, I'm so sorry. Don't worry about it. You got to go. I have. Yeah, we've got to evacuate the building. <laughs> All right, we may come back. We may may get you for another two. There's only going to be another one question anyway. So okay, cool. We'll see you in a bit. Cheers, mate. Bye. Bye.